the thing I love about Alex, he's just so good at what he does and he's very generous with his time, all right? Um, so if you ring up his office, someone's going to give you some really good answers about your site um, for free generally, you know, um, which, is, which is great. Um, he knows his stuff back to front. We were having conversations before this event started with some really intrinsic town planning that they had to work through. Um, he's, he's very creative in what he does. He's got a fantastic team uh, and I love having him here to present. So let's get him out here. Alex Stefan, please come on down. Uh-oh. Can you hear me? Go for it. Hey, yep. thank you very much. Hey, how's, how's everyone doing tonight? Oh, all right. Um, my name's Alex Steffen. I'm a private consultant town planner. Who knows what a town planner does here other than plan towns? So I'm a private consultant town planner. If you asked me to plan your town, I would have absolutely no idea what to do. Um, that is strategic planning. I specialize in development assessment. So... Like I said to someone earlier, I fight council for a living to get approvals for things. Um, I have a Bachelor of Environmental Planning, not that we need it. Um, I'm the director of Stephen Town Planning, director and founder of an app called Property, so I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. And recently, the founder and director of ERPEC, which is the Urban and Regional Planning Education Center. So we have a whole online education platform dedicated to training town planners, um, which has a lot of use for developers too. So we'll, I'll tell you a bit more about that later. We're located in East Brisbane, extremely convenient walking distance to the Gabba, so if you ever want to um, go to a game and butter me up to give you free planning advice, you know, that's how you do it. Uh, there's, yeah, we've been around since 2008, 40 plus years of experience in our office, so there's two directors, um, senior planner, um, and three juniors, so lots of experience. Uh, and we have a development manager too, so if you, we can not only get your approvals, we can also deliver your subdivision from you know, inception right through to plan ceiling and getting your titles. So what does Stefan Town Planning do? That's pretty much me on a daily basis right there. Um, we gain development permits um, through council. So for example, subdivisions, extensions, new houses, townhouses, granny flats, roomy accommodation, whatever it is, we basically deal with it. We only operate in Queensland, so sorry if you're outside of Queensland, but if you are doing stuff on um, south of the border, let me know. We have people down there that can help out. We do development consulting, as I said, um, coordinating developments, due diligence reporting. So if you've got a site that you really need some quick advice on uh, and you need something formal for the bank, for instance, then we can do more official due diligence reporting, show cause matters. So if you do something wrong and you receive a show cause notice or an enforcement notice, the first person you need to call is me. Um, where your best chance of avoiding a fine. Sometimes you just can't avoid it if you've done something really wrong, but anyway. Uh, we do public consultation and we are Risk Smart accredited. So Risk Smart is a process where we can get your approval in five days instead of three to six months. So council give us the ability to, to prepare. We have the honor of preparing the approvals for council to sign. But we get a 20% discount, so it's okay. Um, so tonight, I usually talk about subdivision, and it's because Dave's here, all, everyone here is involved with subdivision. We do a lot more than just subdivision in our business. For example, I was an hour late here because I was stuck on site looking at a heritage building and assessing the, the values with a heritage consultant and the owner um, as to what we can do to basically save it, um, despite councils trying to stop us that whole way. So tonight, I'm going to talk about character houses, what they are, why they're protected, how they're protected, what kinds of character houses there, there are, how to identify one, what requires approval, what doesn't require approval, a bit of a checklist if you're doing new things to character areas, uh, and then a bit of an overview about ERPEC. So why you need to know about a character house in any kind of development is it is the one big Queenslander sitting in the middle of the block that could stop you from doing what you want. Um, whether you're renovating, doing a roomy accommodation, doing a granny flat out the back, if it's got these overlays, you need to know about character houses. So, has, did anyone attend our web, just before I start this, attend our webinar earlier this? Oh, damn. Well, you're going to have a bloody good night. Go up to the bar, put it on um, Matt's account, and... Uh, no. <laughs> so, this is a little bit of a repeat of a webinar that we did earlier this week. Um, that was mainly for building designers and architects. So what is a character house? Does anyone know without looking up there at the very obvious thing that I wrote? So it's like a Queenslander, essentially. So it's, but the thing is, it's not just a Queenslander. It's any building or structure that's built pre-1947. Why are they protected? 
Brisbane City Council did some um, a survey called the and that ended up in this result. Um, what was it? The Better Brisbane Blueprint is the end thing that they had, which is just like, you know, some politicians got together and figured out what they could most easily win votes on, and that's what they decided. And it meant that people valued the Queenslanders. It's a valuable asset to their business, to their livelihoods. So council protect them by way of planning scheme overlays. And these are the overlays that you need to be concerned with. The main two are the top two, so the traditional building character overlay and the pre-1911 building overlay. Interesting, the pre-1911 overlay should really be called the pre-1912 overlay because it actually includes buildings in 1911. Anyway, um, and there's other two overlays, commercial character building overlay and heritage. Both of these are not character overlays, but they still operate in a similar fashion. So what kinds of character houses are they? It's important to go through this because what you would typically think is protected may not always be what is protected. So early colonial, we'll go through a little bit of history. Early colonial buildings, none of them are around anymore. All the timber ones were built on the ground and they got eaten up by termites. So these are probably the two key buildings that are still around. If, if there are buildings that are still around from that early colonial penal settlement, then, then they're basically heritage listed. So you'll know. You're not going to buy it and be like, what? This building's heritage listed? Um, then you go into your late colonial. This is the era that's getting really, really hard to do anything with. So, so this is kind of in your pre-1911 overlay. It doesn't actually necessarily need to be in that overlay to have that really high level of protection. So if you've got something in the late colonial area, kind of 1880 to 19, kind of pre-1911, then they're the houses that you really need to be cautious of because everything is accessible. So, in my opinion, the easiest way to know whether it's pre-1911 is just if it's got a detached stepped-down veranda at the front, it's kind of a dead giveaway. Um, but otherwise, if you see a house that looks anything like these ones, you should be calling someone. Um, and if you call a planner, you really need to find someone who specialises in this stuff. I realised last night that we, we specialise in this. I didn't know that, but... I have, I have been assessing houses like this for 15 years, so I suppose we've learnt something along the way. Um, so if you see a house like that, that's likely pre-war, uh, pre-World War I, and um, everything is protected, not just the front. Um, then you go into your kind of Federation, pre-war era houses, which are your, your more traditional workers' cottage, bungalows. Um, I think we all kind of know what they look like. If anyone's surprised by these images, you're probably not doing too much in Queensland. Um, so these are very. These also have a similar level of protection. There are a lot more exemptions that apply to these houses, but they still have that high level of protection. This is where it gets a very confusing. So then you have these interwar period kind of style houses, which were built from kind of the well the twenties right through to the sixties, really. Um, so you've got. I'll go to the images. So you've got houses. You know these Spanish missionary houses. These um, yeah modernist kind of houses where they actually are protected and they are pre-war and as much as they don't look anything like a Queenslander, they have this exact same level of protection as you know, any of these houses. So just because you go to a site and go, well, that conventional style house doesn't look like a Queenslander, so yeah, let's just bolt, you know, push it over. It's got you know, tiled roofs and no balcony. Still protected, and especially with these kind of ones, these Mediterranean style houses that always throw a curveball in the mix. So how to identify them? Firstly, it has to be pre-1947 to have protection. So if it's built, if you look at the aerial imagery and it's a year later or if you have a building card, it's a, a year later, it's not protected, knock it over, it doesn't matter what it looks like. So, and it has to be in the, tradi in the traditional building character overlay or the pre-1911 overlay. So you could have a pre-war house but not in those overlays, you can still knock it down. So it kind of has to be those two things. Um, just, yeah, that's my disclaimer. There are other overlays that can affect things, but these are the two main ones that we're talking about. So how do I identify it? Very simple. Use the Council Interactive Mapping. So just literally Google Brisbane City Council Interactive Mapping. On there, you can search a property and flick between 2017 and 1946 imagery and see if it looks like the same house. Um, Queensland Government also have a thing called Q Imagery, which is basically... Uh, they've compiled every single aerial image from Queensland from 1932 until now. Uh, and you can download them for free. So you can pretty much look at right back to 1932 to see if it's the same house, and then you can use those images to see how those houses evolved over time. There are other mechanisms of, of reviewing and identifying a character house, um, like, yeah, the registers, 
Trove, um, Quali Explorer. There's basically a thousand different things. Uh, if you're conf if you can't get a simple answer doing those two things and you're still unsure, I would just give us a call. And this is the kind of thing you can do. So, is this a? Oh, it is. So this house came to us, a beautiful Queenslander, um, somewhere. I can't remember where this is, but. The question that we had was, well, is this house protected? Can we knock it over and build something new? And then we looked at the imagery and we're like, well, that looks a bit sus. That's the most recent one that we could find. Then we had a look at the original 1946 image, which you can kind of see it's like a bit of a square with a kind of little part out the side. 1960, we found on Q imagery, um, it's still got that little part out the side. Maybe it's a bit more out there and there's this part at the back. And then 2017, you can kind of see, you know, the same thing from 1960s happened. So when we actually looked at it, you can actually, you can actually clearly identify where the original house is from 1946. So as much as none of this house at the front or the sides is protected, that part is. So all of a sudden, council aren't approving the demolition of it and you're stuck with this. So that's why it's important to review these things. Obviously, it only matters if it's in a traditional wooden character overlay. Um, I'll skip through a couple of things because did not time this presentation. Um, there is a thing called prescribed accepted development. Has anyone heard of this term before? Yeah. So this is something you should be very familiar with. It's from this table in the city plan. So if you just search that table in city plan, it's basically a list, which is quite long, as you can see. And this is what you don't need approval for. So essentially, if it's not prescribed accepted, it triggers a DA, generally. So to give you an example of prescribed accepted demolition, so things that you can demolish to these houses, you can raise a house, you can demolish internal walls of features, um, st external stairs, and uh, demolition to facilitate internal building work, external features, windows, doors, balustrades, where we're replacing like for like. So there's a lot you can do without council permits, um, but it's really important to get that table and burn it into your memory if you're doing anything to do with Queenslanders. So that's demolition. So if we're looking at a house, what, how old do we think this house is? What do, we, what do we reckon? Have we learnt anything? We go, I'm going to say 1924. I have no idea where this is, so I just screenshot it off Google. So we'll never be able to check it. Actually, if someone does want to check it, what's that? Stafford Street, 32. <laughs> someone. Anyway, so this is prescribed accepted demolition work. So you could knock everything off from that point backwards, no approval necessary. So this whole area, including that because it looks post-war, so you could demolish all of that, no approval necessary from council, but that's only if it's not pre-1911. So if we did a bit more research and figured out, well, hang on, maybe this house is pre-1911, then you couldn't do any of that anymore and you require approval for absolutely everything. That raises some issues and this is kind of why we get paid so much. Um, well, not enough in my opinion, but why we get paid. Because you have issues like this. So the exemption says, you know, all internal demolition work is exempt and you don't require approval. All internal work, new building work is exempt. So then you have situations like this where it's like, well, that's the external wall. So there's everything internal from that, even though it's a full, fully, con you know, um, protected balcony in there that's still in its original form. Technically, it's inside. So can you demolish it? Can you do whatever you want? Yes, in my opinion. But that's where council will start being greedy and just start raising all kinds of issues and go full cowboy on you. So another issue is, is, the, is it pre-1911? So council just will make a determination based on how they feel on the day as to whether or not your house is pre-1911. Likewise with advice from planners. So if you talk to your planner and go, hey, look, I want to buy this house. Um, can I knock off the whole back and do an extension? If they look at it and go, yeah, it's probably just pre-1947, you're all good, go for it. If they don't look at that and just double check to see whether it is pre-1911, and it is, you're screwed. So you can't do what you want anymore. So very important to check that. Um, and then obviously determining whether the features are original, what parts of it are original, you know, when was that enclosed? We found ones that were enclosed pre-war that these houses were built in you know, the 1920s, and then in the 1940s it was built in, so even though it's not really intent what it was originally intended, it's actually all protected. Um, so prescribed accepted building work, we've talked about demolition work. Again, there is a crap load of stuff you could do, all in this table. Download that table, 
you know, print it out, put it on your fridge, read it to your kids to go to sleep. They'll be gone. I've tried it on my daughter. She doesn't understand. She's only one, but... Um, so, enclosing, enclosed extension under an existing building, um, ex- enclosed extension at the rear, stairs, internal building work, carports. You can do quite a lot to these places without council permits. So, sometimes a lot of our job is convincing people to not use us um, to save them some cash. So, when you look at what you can do without a permit, there's quite a lot. So, you could build you know, some big monolithic structure right up above it. You could build anything you want in the backyard. So nothing of that requires approval either. So essentially what I'm doing here is confusing you enough to want to give me a call. Again, there's going to be issues with prescribed accepted building work, interpretation things. Last night there was an industry forum and council was very confused as to what grey area there is. Uh, But there is certainly a lot of grey area, which is the value of giving me a call. So... You know, building towards the rear is exempt. So if you demolish all of this, is now here the rear? Well, technically, for a moment in time, it would be, but really the rear is back here behind the house. So, yep, that's tricky. Um, Building under previously enclosed rooms. So you can build under, you say, enclose under a building where it's restricted to the core of the original building. So situations like this, well, that's enclosed. So is that now the core? We don't know. Um, so that's what we, we can give you some advice on. This is a great one. You can demolish stairs. You can rebuild stairs. No approval necessary. But if you want to replace the balustrade from where the stairs used to be, you need approval. So, so these are the kinds of things that we deal with all day, every day. As a very quick checklist, if you're doing anything in a character area, anything to do with a character overlay... Oh, hang on. Yes, I have this. Th- this is the checklist. So one thing to say, the dwelling house character overlay. Who's come across that overlay before? Yeah, it's everywhere. Yes, it is. It is not a character overlay. So it has the word character in it, frustratingly. The dwelling house character overlay is basically an overlay that triggers the dwelling house code. It means absolutely nothing to do with character. I get emails, I'm going to say at least once a day from someone saying, hey, this has a bunch of character overlays, don't know what I can do, can you give me some advice? And I go, It has no character overlays. It has this overlay. It's not a character overlay. So yeah, ignore that one. So this is the checklist. You need a balcony overlooking the street. Tick. If you don't have that, counts will make your life miserable and you will eventually have that. You need to retain all of the integral components of the original house. Integral components is a very contentious little um, two words. Basically, right now, it means absolutely everything. Everything is integral to council, so to keep as many windows, gables, balconies, fretwork, keep it all if you can. Um, you need to use timber and tin materials, colour bond, horizontal cladding, timber features, you know, timber balustrade, don't try to put a glass balustrade in, council's not going to like it. So this is the ultimate checklist. If you came to me with this on your plans, thank you. Um, it doesn't always work like that. Lightweight design, you know, recessing the garage back, having nice overshadowing effects of the front facade. Front setback needs to be the average of 20% of other nearby pre-1947 dwellings. So get that imagery up, see how what the setback of the original houses were. You have to be within 20% of that. Um, and plans. This is very important. You need an architect who deals with character stuff. If you don't have an architect or a building designer who has n- never heard of character before, it will be an absolute disaster, and I guarantee you will spend triple the amount of money um, because we will be going back and forth thousands of times. So pre- and post-war demolition plans are very important. You need to make it as simple and easy to read for council as possible. So, you know, green demolition means it's a, you know, post, post-war demolition, so demolition to things that were built post-1946, and then pre is red, so that's accessible. Anyway, very simple things, but somehow gets missed a lot. So, Urban and Regional Planning Education Centre, I thought I'd just quickly touch on this. So, we have an an entire online education platform dedicated to training town planners. So, every single university in Queensland that offers a town planning degree offers this, or offers our courses to their students. We give them a 95% discount. So, if you are a student studying at a university, um, drop me an email, you, you will probably get a discount. Um, And the courses, why bring this up? We have courses down here specific to property developers too. So it is extremely competitive at the moment out there, as I'm sure you're all aware. And you basically need to make decisions on the 
right there and then. You can't be like, let me call my planner, then let me call my engineer, then let me call my arborist, because it's gone. So we have a, probably the biggest one is our site finding course. It's 350 bucks when it means you're winning or losing a property worth millions of dollars. Don't whinge to me about it being $350. Um, so this will give you all of the information that if you gave me a call and said, hey, Alex, I want to do this with this property, from the time that I say, hey, thanks, what's the address to me giving you an answer, that's what I do. So our other courses, development assessment course, don't do that unless you want to be a town planner. Uh, Koala planning provisions course, don't do that unless you're very interested um, or you want to be an ecologist. So yeah, that's me. Uh, there's my details. Email me, call me. Um, like the seven of us in our office, so I am on the phone a lot, unfortunately. So if you can't get through to me, just go through the general inquiries line and someone will be able to help you. Visit our website, we have lots of free content. Add me on LinkedIn. I love just throwing shade at councils, um, which is very entertaining. And we do a masterclass series in our business, um, which we I said earlier, we did one on character housing. Our next one's on dual occupancy, auxiliary units, and granny flats. So if you're doing anything to do with those, um, attend our next masterclass because this one will be over at Queensland. And yeah, check out these resources. And that's me. Legend. Thanks, mate. Round of applause for Alex. <laughs> mate, any, before you go, any quick questions for Alex before we move on? We, oh, yeah, we got a couple. Okay. <laughs> Let's get the mics out. Just hang on. We'll get a mic over. I did just like smash through that. You did, mate. You nailed it. You nailed I have it. to say, I, so my, my webinar version of that went for an hour. And I was just like going through and I was like, I'll just start deleting slides and then, yeah, anyway. 20 minutes goes 20 minutes. real quick. Yeah. Hey Alex, thanks for the presentation. Um, what's going on with Development Eye and PD Online? Just yep. technical question, but yeah, Development Eye seems to have replaced PD Online. Just what's, what's the big yeah. picture, the thinking? Yeah, Yeah. so, so, so for anyone who's unaware, um, Council will have a PD Online, Planning and Development Online, which had a full history of applications that have been lodged and decided since 2001. Um, they basically, in my opinion, they got upselled to a better system uh, called Development I, which is like a online... Sunshine Coast uses that one. Yes, well, yeah. Sunshine Coast one works great though, yeah. so I don't know what Brisbane's doing. Um, and then the feedback that we got is they were transitioning all the data over through the start of this year, and then there was just too much, so they stopped. And I'm not even kidding, that's what they told us. So we're like, how do we find other stuff and they go you're just going to have to call us so you know that's your taxpayer money really yeah. going to work really there. efficient yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah so yeah, unfortunately it sucks and we all have to deal with it so cool yeah stevie's got a question up here thanks hi alex thanks for that um i have a question about if you happen to contact someone at council who's having a bad day and they say no or they give you um hassles can you challenge them and does it happen very often yeah yeah i mean that's that's what we do for a living so yeah, you don't, if, if it's a long conversation, but I mean, you got to think the most experienced person at Brisbane City Council is probably 15 years, maybe 20 years, and they probably have done development assessment for maybe five of those years, the rest of them would be managing roles. So no one there really knows what's going on. So you, we generally know a lot more than they know about their own planning scheme. So you never take no for an answer, but it has to be within reason. So you can't just be like, I want to demolish my house because I hate it. And it's like, well, no, there's no grounds for that. But if there's grounds for something, then we will push it. And I'm sure there's people in the room that we've done that with. Matt, we've done that with you. Um, where, you know, if it's a legitimate good outcome and council saying no and they have no reason to say no, then we'll fight them to the death. <laughs> I wish it was to the death. <laughs> <laughs> One day. Thanks, Stevie. It's up the back there. Hey, dear. Yep. How are you? Just need the mic. Great presentation, thank you. thank you. My question is, if you did make a mistake and you demolished the wrong thing, what's the worst that could happen? Um, oh. Well, you can go to jail. <laughs> so, yeah, you can go to jail. Um, I mean, realistically, you'd, get a, a, you'd be slapped with a fine. Um, the thing is, like I just said, there's a people in there who don't really know what's going on. So sometimes what we do is get people to do accessible building work and then we get the building work approved, and then all of then we then we send that to the compliance office and go, hey, look, don't worry, it's all approved. 
and they don't know that, that we actually needed another permit for the demolition, and then they just sign it off, and then it's all gone and it disappears. So that's why I said, if you get a show cause notice, the first thing you need to do is call us, because we're the ones that will conjure up some evil plan to <laughs> you know, save, save you. So. <laughs> I pro- I, yeah, I'm not really selling myself, am I? Or maybe no, I am. Mate, it's, I got, it's coming across really well. I've, I've got all these visuals happening of yeah. you and council going at it. You come into <laughs> offices, be cold, yeah. <laughs> cool. Last one. Like, one more question. Is there someone at the back here? No? No. Okay, cool. Um, all right, mate. Thank you so much. Round of applause again for Alex. Thank you, everyone. Champion. <laughs> <laughs>